Hey, my wife and I, my wife's amazing. She was hosting over here at 515, way better than me. Can I get an amen on that? I didn't ask for claps. I asked for an amen. Claps were a little bit too energetic, you know? But I agree. Uh, we have a four-year-old, we have a two-year-old, and just uh, a few days into our firstborn's life, we were still at the hospital, and the doctors and the nurses came in, and they told us something very alarming, very discouraging. We got any parents of young kids in here, by the way? Um, we're all tired, amen? But they came and told us, it's time to go home. <laughs> we're like, um, um, um. What, uh, excuse me? They're like, yeah, you're two days in, you're doing good so far. I'm like, we're not doing good so far. We're losing our minds. We're panicking. We're so exhausted. And y'all have been taking them at night from us and bringing them back. Like, have you been watching us? We have no idea what we're doing. And now you expect us to take this human home and keep him alive? You can't, will you please reconsider your decision to release us from the hospital? Have any parents been there? You're like, we're not, we're not ready for this. And what they did was they made us watch a video that was filmed in 1972, 15 minutes about how to be a parent. And then they said, good luck. Put us in the car on the way home. We were like, what in the world? That's our kid and now it's up to us to keep them alive and we have no idea how we're gonna do it and it just came with good luck from the doctors. But I kind of wonder if that's how we approach our faith with God, our life on earth, following Jesus as a Christian amidst the pressures of this life, the highs and lows, the ups and downs, all the things that we're trying to navigate, we kind of, I think, slip into the thinking that God has saved us by grace through faith and that we get a secured spot in heaven. But then while we're on earth, he just kind of says, hey, don't mess up, good luck, see you in heaven, and I, I'll kind of keep an eye on you here and there. But I, I don't know if you believe that, I don't know if I really believe that because I believe that God, the gospel isn't just getting us to heaven, but it's getting heaven's help to us, right? I, I don't think we believe God's just saying, good luck, do it on your own, don't mess up. I just think that we often live like that. If you look at our daily rhythms, if you look at our mentality, we just think that God's left us to navigate this challenging thing called life on earth with all that it comes with. We just kind of act like we gotta do this on our own. I got this, look mom, no hands, I can do this. But that's not God's heart, that's not God's plan, that's not what he has sent Jesus from heaven to save us and give us new life in Christ. That's not his plan for us here on earth. And so if you got your scripture, let's go to 1 Peter chapter five. Now, really excited about this. We am gonna uh, continue in the flow of Ben's talk from last week. If you missed it, check it out on the podcast. But Ben's talk was all about the anxieties and releasing anxieties in our life. It's really encouraging to help us to, that we see that God's not looking over, ignoring, making fun of, looking down on, or even condescending us for our anxieties and pressures, but he's actually inviting us to lay them at his feet. He wants to help, he wants to carry them for us. We're not meant to carry them on our own. That's what we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, um, verse 6. I'll start there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's last week's talk. And it says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So we talked about in internal pressures last week. But today we're stepping in in verse eight and it says we're, talking about the, we're gonna talk about the external pressures that are coming at you. And I don't know how often you think about it, but what this script, scripture says is that we're in a battle. 
We are in a fight. We are in a contest with a very powerful opponent. Other translations call him an adversary. What does it say about this adversary? It's not like he's just some little, you know, nemesis over in the corner on our left shoulder, but it, it's like a lion, a good hunter that doesn't want to be seen. And you're like, man, this is about to get weird. Angels, demons, spiritual warfare. You're like, what, what have I shown up to? And I don't understand it all. So I'm not here to give like the treatise on angels, demons, spiritual warfare, but I am here to say that you're in a battle. You're in a fight with a very powerful opponent that's, roar, that's prowling around like a roaring lion. And it's not just to nag you, not just to bother you, not just to confuse you, even though that's what the devil does, right? He has blinded the minds and the hearts of the unbelievers, but he's here to devour you. You're like, whoa. This isn't a Nerf gun fight in the backyard. This is a high stakes match with a deadly opponent. And I don't know if that scares you. I already mentioned it could weird you out or it could be honestly like me and you, you might be like me. I just don't even think about it all that much. I'm like, I can't see the devil. I can't see this spiritual warfare. So I must just think that it's just, it's not real. But what scripture is saying is no, we need to realize that we're in a fight. And we have a deadly opponent. Other scriptures say the same thing. In Ephesians um, chapter six, um, let's see. It says, for our struggle, verse 12, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You're like, oh, I thought my struggle was against my boss or my ex or my group of friends or my bank account or just from this far off thing. It's like, no, actually, our struggle's against something greater than that. Our struggle's not always against flesh and blood. Like, no, 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 I'm pretty sure my, my, all my issues have to do with that business partner that you know, stabbed me in the back. Has to do with that boyfriend that broke up with me. That's all my struggles, no. I'm not overlooking any wrongdoing someone's done. But all the wrongdoing in this earth is the result of sin and the work of the devil, right? And so I think we too oftentimes, yes, we, people harm us, people hurt us, people have bailed out on us. But we also have to be willing to recognize the power of sin and the power of evil that is at work in the world. And we can't just, mi we sometimes misidentify the issue, right? We have a struggle, we have a fight. Jesus said when he was on earth, I have come so you can have life, life to the full. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? Right before that, but he has come that you might, the devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy. You're like, what? I thought it was all about going to heaven and having this best life on earth. Now you're telling me I'm in a battle? I believe even talking about it, though, helps us understand why that we're, we're in a fight. Because we got struggles. We got issues. We got challenges. Like, why is this happening? I believe at least calling it out just gives us comfort, right? Um, there is attacks that are coming on you, on your faith in God, on your marriage, on your family, on your purpose in life, on your joy, on your mind, on your purity. There is somebody that's sending, the scripture says, flaming arrows trying to take you out. You're like, whoa, okay. The stakes are a little bit higher than I wake up to every single morning thinking about. But I, I, sadly, I think most of us just give up. We hear about this spiritual warfare hear about these attacks that are coming our way. You're like, man, it's not possible to live for God. It's not possible to stand firm in the faith. It's not possible to stay on the Jesus route. I'm just gonna give in because I'm not powerful enough. I'm not strong enough. We give in. We don't have the right mindset. We live defeated. And so we're not even trying to win this battle, trying to fight this battle. We're just going about our business, doing our own thing. Whatever happens, happens. 
It reminds me of a race that I was once in. You know, I, I don't talk about this much, but I used to be a track star. Um, if it's okay, I'd love to brag for a moment. I mean, humbly speaking about my track career, it all was uh, pinnacle. The beginning and the end was the fifth grade track meet. Some call it field day, but come on, this was a really intense, any field day stars in the house, come on. You're like the glory days, right? When recess, people were talking about how great we were. Yeah, all downhill from there. But it was a high moment in my athletic career with track in fifth grade. You might've heard this story actually, but um, in fourth grade, again, humbly speaking, (laughs) Cumberland, uh, I know you're really entertained by this as well, but fourth grade, my team, we were the defending champs of the four by four mixed race relay, right? We were a power house of Canyon High or Elementary School, not even high school, Canyon <laughs> Elementary School in West Texas. Well, the next year comes along and it's our you know, last race before we have to go to the big leagues of middle school. And we, of course, are gonna be the defending, we're gonna represent our class as the defending champs in the all school track meet, except for one issue, another team decided they wanted to challenge us from our class. And I'm like, how dare you, right? Get behind me, Satan kind of thing. Like we are the champs, but we still had to entertain their you know, wishes and their dreams that were not gonna come to reality. So we had to do a race at like PE class, right? And uh, sure enough, first leg goes okay. Second leg, poor girl on the other team, she trips and falls. And we, as we expected to, just smoked them across the race, right? Except one problem, the teacher decided that we should do a redo because she tripped and fell. And I'm like, excuse me, this is not upward basketball, right? This is, we can't just enable people by overlooking mistakes. This is not preparing her well for life, right? I don't keep in touch with her, but I would imagine her life is a train wreck because of that decision right there to not let her see, sorry, that was too far. Uh, I'm just bitter, I'm just mad, right? But I'm like, are you, ki- are you serious? We're, this isn't the way life works. But we don't always get these second chances, but we'll run it again and we'll win anyway, right? So you know where this is going. We run the race again and I was the last leg. I'm not trying to brag, but I was you know, really amazing in fifth grade. But the last leg comes, we're behind. And I start running as fast as I can. And I quickly realize there's no way we're gonna catch up. And this was like my life's work on the line. This is what I was living for. And I only had one option, don't judge me. But what did I do? I tripped and fell. (laughs) And I was gonna live for another day. And I had a great argument. But sadly, I also learned I'm never gonna win an Academy Award because the teacher was like, you faked that, they win, it's over. (laughs) And I also hate to admit that I cried right there on that spot. (laughs) And I have friends that remind me of that to this very day. But we're in a struggle, people. Life on earth, yes, we've been saved. We have the peace of God and the joy of God, but while we're on earth, we're gonna struggle. While we're in the flesh, Till we get to heaven, there's gonna be things that come our way, both internally and externally. And I want you to know today that we can't live with a defeated mindset and just give up and just trip our way out of the race to say, we're not even gonna try to get to the finish line. That's not what God's calling you to do. He says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, right? And he, we gotta get rid of the sin that easily entangles and the chains that are holding us back. And let's run the race that God's marked out for us. We can't live defeated. We can't give in. I, I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what your challenges are. I'm just saying you're in a fight and it's time to, it's not time to give up or give in, but the battle is worth it. You're like, yeah, Brad, if this, if this devil is a roaring lion, flaming arrows, how do, we, how do we even deal? How is it even possible? Well, scripture helps us here in 1 Peter, back to 1 Peter 5, verse 8. It says, be self-controlled and alert. Be self-controlled and alert. Well, I I think the first thing that we need to do is, is just simply that we need to be alert. We need to expect adversity. 
that word self-controlled in other translations, it means, it says sober-minded. Anybody know what sober means? Is everybody sober right now? <laughs> you weren't responding, so I'm like, it's still fairly early on a Sunday, but it, sober-minded means to be clear-minded, free from illusion. We need to control ourselves. We need to take some ownership, but part of being clear-minded is realizing we're all susceptible. I think when we think that we've got it made, that we think we've shed something from the past, when we think that we can do it on our own, that we think that we've you know, had victory over certain areas of our life, we just walk around like, man, I got this, I'm good. And that's right when the enemy likes to attack. All of us you know, are in the flesh. All of us are gonna have challenges. We just need to be clear-minded, sober-minded to realize we're not that far, any of us from derailing our lives, from making poor choices that could cost us and cost people around us in a really, really significant way. It says be self-controlled and be alert. We've already talked about that we're in a fight. We just need to be aware of it. So, so many of us, including me, we walk around sleepwalking to the fact that there's an enemy. And so we just need to be aware that we're in a fight because when we, we know we're in a fight, I'm no boxing expert, by the way, but I have seen Creed 1 and Creed 2, so... Anybody with me? I know that if you're in a fight, then you, if you know you're in a fight, then you're gonna get ready to fight. You're, that's part of being alert. Let me get my hands up. Let me cover my face. Let me be ready to go. Because when I, the shots are coming, I'm not surprised. They're not coming out of nowhere. I know I'm in a fight. You gotta be alert, right? Every morning. That's why prayer is really important. That's why acknowledging the, the battle that you're in will help you so much when you wake up, not just going through the motions, doing your own thing. You're like, no, this, there's, a, there's something happening. There's a battle being waged. My heart is on the line. My faith is on the line. My family's on the line. My kids are on the line. My church is on the line. There is somebody coming at me wanting to destroy all of that. My standing at work is on the line. My purpose and God using me is on the line. We wake up, we think about that. We start, think, we start praying differently. We start training differently. We start acting differently when we realize we're in the middle of a battle against forces in the heavenly realms. We're alert to we're in the fight, but we also have to be alert to the schemes, the specific schemes of the devil. You know, the best teams or even the best military conquests, right? They're always gonna study the opponent's tendencies, the opponent's plans. So, so much of coaching these days is watching films, not of your team, but of the other team to try to find the weak spot, find the strategy, find the plan. And that's what the devil has done with you and with me. He's watched our film. He knows our moves. He knows our weak spots, our blind spots, our vulnerabilities. And you know where he's coming to attack? That spot. Keep pushing, keep pulling, keep pointing you in that direction. Whether it be it's this it's jealousy that kind of has a hold on you. It's like those moments, he's just gonna always try to get his voice a little bit louder. Oh, you should be jealous. They have way more than you. Their life's way better than yours. And all of a sudden, jealousy takes over your life. Could be lust. And it's always trying to put you in the position where you're gonna look the wrong way or think the wrong way and make the wrong decision. Could just be pride. It's trying to read you your mail. You're awesome. You've done this on your own. You've made it on your own. You don't need anybody's help. You are a self-made man or woman. You're not standing on anybody's shoulders. It's all about you. Because that's what the devil does, right? He promotes a we, a me-centered mentality. And that's why you know it's an attack. If it's all about how you gotta get yours and what you need, you know that's not from God. God's always promoting we and others. The devil's always gonna promote, oh, it's, it's just about you. It's just about you, not anybody else. It's just about you. He's got some strategies. Maybe it's bitterness. It says in scripture that he's, don't give the devil a foothold. Devil's trying to get a foothold. He's trying to get that spot where he can just pull anytime he wants and take control of your life. Have you turned your back on God? 
There's specific things that are controlling our lives. The devil knows them, but it, I think it even helps when we're alert to where he's gonna come after us. Be alert to where to fight, be alert to his schemes, right? Expect that adver adversity. When we know we're gonna get attacked there, we start guarding that area of our life. We start making decisions. We start praying against that certain area of life. I know God, I'm struggling in this area. I'm gonna tell some people, I'm gonna get around a group of people and I'm gonna expect that adversity because I know it's coming. You know it's coming, you're ready to fight. Another a, a scheme of the devil is just to cast doubt blows the wind of doubt into our lives. You're like, how do you know that, Brad? Well, in the account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that's what the serpent was doing. Genesis chapter three, right? Two and three, it's all about him just saying, because there was one rule, right? In the garden, Adam and Eve had the whole garden. It's made by God. They were put there by God. Cultivate and steward. It's amazing. It's beautiful. They realized who they were. They knew who God was and they had a great relationship. But then that crafty, deceiving serpent started talking, started speaking. And what was his strategy? What was his scheme? It was like, because they were given, hey, cultivate, just don't eat of the knowledge of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? This tree, this one tree. And like, did God really say that? Did God really not want you to eat there? Don't you think God's holding out on you? Don't you think you're missing out? Don't you see how good this looks? And they had the whole thing, just one testing of their faith and the devil got in there casting doubt on God's presence, on God's goodness. He's doing the same thing for you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't have the best for you. Choosing God's gonna make you miss out. You're not gonna get that promotion. You're not gonna get that attention. You're not gonna get that success if you go God's way. You're not gonna get married if you do it God's way. You're not gonna have a great house and a great family, a great bank account. You're not gonna have fun if you don't do it God's way. That's all the voice of the enemy, the roaring lion. We have to be alert. And then I already mentioned it. He's always gonna try to carve some division between people. That's his scheme. Turn to me. I want you to see this. This has been really helpful for me. Second Corinthians chapter two. It's always a little bit intimidating to find a verse of scripture in front of a bunch of people as you're talking. I realized I was going there. I could have marked it, but now I found it. Here we go. Sorry, that's just me talking out loud. I, it's an issue. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. And there's been some struggle based on a decision that somebody else made. But now it's created some controversy and some friction amongst Paul and this church. And so he says, I, I, I can't break the whole thing down, but if you forgive anyone, verse 10, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven him, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order, check this out, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. He's trying to outsmart you by coming in and using something that didn't happen to you, but to somebody else and get differing opinions, different conflict, different point of views. It's like, okay, these are the Jesus people, but all of a sudden I've got in there, it's about who was right, who was wrong, who did what, who, did, who said what. And you're like, next thing you know, he's got a wedge of division. I mean, have you ever thought about that? A lot of the conflict in your life? I've, I've been around a lot of conflict and it, it breaks my heart because if you would actually, including some of the stuff that I've caused and I've blow, blown wind on, but it, if you look back to the very beginning, everybody was here, everybody was good. And it wasn't this big giant decision, whether it be your family, your marriage, your organization, your friendship, right? It wasn't this big giant decision, but it was just slowly, 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 small decisions that moved you further and further and further away. And now the person that you said the vows to is your worst enemy. And it's like, man, if we just would have paid attention to the schemes of the devil here, he's trying to get a wedge, he's trying to create division. And yeah, you can get further down here. And at some point you're like, hey, this is, 
the result of sin, evil. Let's try to get it back together and let's not give up hope. And I, I just think we just have to be aware of his schemes. He's trying to, in your marriage, in your family, in this church, he's trying to get a foothold where all of a sudden we're, we're fighting each other. Man, the devil is like, the Christians, they're fighting again. This is right where I want them. You're like, are you kidding me? There's a much greater evil going on. We don't need to spend our time fighting with one another, but that's the scheme of the evil one. We, we, we've got these weaknesses and we need to be aware of them, right? Because he studied our film. Uh, another athletic endeavor for me, or actually this isn't all that impressive, but I played tennis in high school. I'll just say I had a decent, pretty good serve, decent, pretty good forehand. I'm no Grant Partrick who's over at Cumberland right now. He's amazing. I refuse to play him, but I had a terrible backhand. Uh, terrible. It was embarrassing so much. If you played, so I'm hitting forehand this way, backhand this way, right? If you played me and it was coming towards my backhand over here, I would do like the biggest move over here. You know, I looked like it. I mean, I was so embarrassing playing tennis, but I'm like, I've got a weakness. And so I'm going to try to compensate and I'm going to hit my forehand, right? Well, any smart opponent in warmups is like, that guy's afraid to hit his backhand. What are they going to do? They're going to hit it at the backhand every single time. And I was insecure, I was nervous, I wasn't confident, but did, something did change. I started showing up to warmups, not just thinking about my weakness, but I started thinking about their weakness and their vulnerabilities. And I want you to know that the devil has weaknesses. He has vulnerabilities. His power is, uh, is limited. We just sang about it, right? Jesus is the one, come on, we gonna amen from here. Jesus is the one that makes darkness tremble, right? Jesus is the one that conquers death, sin, hell once for all. The devil knows his destiny and that's to be a footstool for the name and the person of Jesus. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. He's seen our film, but we've seen his film. So let's keep going back to 1 Peter chapter five. It says, uh, we've got to expect adversity. Then it says in verse nine, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We got to resist them. We want to experience victory. We have to resist him firm in your faith. What's the last, if you're filling in some of the blanks there and continuing the sentence, it's firm in your faith in yourself. Firm in your faith in willpower. Firm in the faith of uh, good choices. No, it's not firm in the faith of us. It's firm in the faith of God, right? Right? who he is and what he's done. And so, yes, there are things that you and I need to do to experience this victory. But more than anything, we need to declare, we need to believe, we need to cling to, we need to remind ourselves of Christ's ultimate victory. If we wanna have victory on this earth, then we just need to keep reminding ourselves of Christ's ultimate victory. Cling to it, celebrate it, champion it. Well, you're like, man, why... Have you ever wondered why church is important? Like, is it just the thing that we do that we're in the South? I believe, God, I, I believe God's moving in your heart even when you walked in, into the parking lot, to the parking deck, or into the building, into the high school. You're like, man, I, I sense something. But what we're doing when we come together as these saints, right? It's so beautiful and powerful is we're declaring Christ's victory to ourselves and to each other. Yes, God's honored when we bring him a song of praise. He loves it. But also it helps us because we're reminding ourselves we're in a battle, right? But the war has already been won. And we're going to continue to struggle. But the help for our struggle is to remind ourselves of Christ's ultimate victory. And when Elisha, his servant, right, they were uh, uh, surrounded by enemies, right? Right? And he prayed for his servant to be able to see. He said, open his eyes to see what Elisha, the great prophet, could see. He said, greater, right? Is the, the more powerful are the forces with us than those that are against us. And there was the angel armies that were surrounding the armies. Same's true for you and for me. We just need our eyes open to see. We have a, a strong, 
loving, heavenly father that's there. He wants to help us. He wants to help you. So why do we resist his help? We're supposed to resist the devil, but so many times we're resisting God's help. It's like, it's like my son, Caleb. I love trying to teach him things. So Brittany's a designer and she's artistic and she's teaching them all these things to build and paint and, de- and I can't even like, I should be teaching them one, things to build, but I love teaching them sports. And he loves like golf clubs right now. And I'm like, buddy, let me, let me help you. Let me show you how to stand. Let me show you how to hold the club. I'm not all that great, but at least I know way more than you do as a four-year-old. And he's like, no, daddy, I can do it. I'm like, no, no offense, bud, but you're holding the head of the club, right? <laughs> not the handle. And you haven't hit it in 10 minutes. Don't you think that you need some help? He's like, no, 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 I got it. And that's, that's the rhythm of our lives. Even Jesus, when his disciples ask, hey, teach us how to pray. And we, we all know that prayer. We've recited it, uh, most of us, in awkward moments when we figure out, figure out we learned a different translation than everybody else. But Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, our debts and debtors, right? It says, lead us not and to temptation, but deliver us from evil. So even in the model prayer, Jesus said, Father, we've been talking about having a perfect heavenly father, lead, lead me, help me, not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil that's in the world. We, he wants us to come to him. He loves when we draw near. He's not like, oh, you need help with that again? Oh, I've taught you, I've told you how many times we're gonna go through this. He's like, oh, that's my girl. That's my boy and I love nothing more because I know how hard life is. I know the challenges. I know what they're up against. Jesus, right? Right before he gave that model prayer was in the desert going toe to toe with the devil where the devil was casting doubt on Jesus. If you're the really the son of God, Jesus can sympathize, scripture says, with our weaknesses. And he loves it when we come to him and ask for help. Because when we come to him, we start getting that victory mindset that he wants us to have. That's the thing, is when we start praying, when we start believing, when we start declaring God's ultimate victory, then all of a sudden we start believing. And we don't give up. But I can win. I can overcome. I can break the mold. I can do things differently. I don't have to follow in the pattern of the world or the pattern of my family. Or I don't have to be disowned by these destructive thoughts and tendencies that are just waging war against my soul. I can have victory. Victory is possible. Freedom is possible. My heart breaks. Because in this room and in North Atlanta High School, there are countless numbers of us that are struggling with the same thing we've been struggling with for years, decades. And sure, some of them could be thorns in our flesh that remind us of the grace of God in our lives. Paul had one of those. We're not really sure what it was. But I also know Paul was teaching that if we live by the spirit, we should be putting to death the deeds of darkness. And so think if if you and I really believe, and again, we're all gonna struggle. If you don't struggle with anything, come up and teach next week. I extend the invitation on behalf of Louis. Just come and speak for the rest of the year, right? Or we'll just do a show of hands. Who's struggling with something right now? We're not gonna do, you know, turn to your neighbor and say your deepest, darkest sin, but like, come on, I'll just say for myself, I know, as a pastor, don't be discouraged, but I know my battle with sin's not gonna be over until I get to heaven. But that doesn't mean I just give up and believe that victory is not possible. Victory is possible. Freedom is possible. Shame free is possible. Guilt gone is possible because Jesus has won the ultimate victory. We got any uh, dog fans in the house? Any dog fans at Cumberland? 
Lots of Aggies over there, I believe, in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, on September the 7th, in just a few months from now, the great and mighty Murray State Racers are gonna walk in. Did somebody clap for Murray State? <laughs> Did anybody know that, that you were playing Murray State? They're gonna walk into Samford Stadium. They're gonna get off the bus, and their coach, I don't know him, but bless his heart, his name's Mitch Stewart, and he is gonna give a speech to his team. And he is gonna do his very best with all of his heart to convince those racers that they have a chance. I'm not even a dog fan, I don't, you know, so I, for, I mean, I would love the Murray State racers to win. Maybe this is a prophetic moment, but, uh, oh, we got one yes, we got one amen, we got one let them use you right here down front. So <laughs> he's gonna do his best to try to convince his team that they have what it takes to beat the mighty dogs at home when no one even knows their mascot's name or if they have a football team, they just know they got, we know that they got somebody drafted or gonna get drafted in the first round of the NBA draft, right? They have no shot. It's all gonna be hype. Point zero 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 one percent chance of winning that game. The odds, not that you're a betting person, but the odds are gonna be terrible. But that's not the case with you, with me. We have been given everything we need for a life of godliness, right? God has made it possible by a father in heaven, the Holy Spirit living in us, the example of Jesus that we can walk in victory and freedom. And we need to start believing it by having that mindset. I'll close with this. Really want to encourage you to be alert, to choose a victory mindset, but I also want you to realize it's not just about being saved from someone, the roaring lion, the enemy, the adversary. It's not just about being saved from someone, but it's being saved for someone. I love the Lord's prayer. I was just mentioning it. Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That word deliver also means rescue. And it's not just rescuing from something, it's talking about drawing to one's self. Delivering to someone and for someone. So we're not just asking God to lead us away from the evil one, but we're asking him and he's asking, he's invited us, he sent Jesus for us to rescue us from something but to deliver us to him, for him. I think about it when I asked Brittany to marry me. I was delivering her from the life of singleness, right? Into amazingness. Can I get an amen? My guy that said, let him use me over here. I, I, you sit on the front row every single week. I'll put a reserve sign right over there. But. He's chased you down, fights till you've been found. No wall he didn't kick down. No lie he doesn't want to tear down. Coming after you to save you from, but to save you for. Because God's plans, despite the lies of the enemy, are for your good, are for your best, are for what will satisfy you give you the most joy, purpose, fulfillment. It's not lies, it's promises. And he has that for you, right? It's what even First Peter was saying towards the end of that. It says, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power or to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. And so that's what God's doing. He's rescued us from the ultimate power, but then he's giving us power, restoring us, strengthening us, reminding us here on this earth so we can live not for the lives of the enemy and the empty things of the world, but we can live for the glory of God and that's gonna be for our good, that's gonna go on forever and ever and ever. So the world and the devil, it can lie, but you keep your eyes on Jesus and he's got nothing but the best. And you'll suffer for a little while, 
It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna make mistakes. I'm gonna make mistakes. For, I mean, we're not even gonna get out of the parking lot without getting in a fight with somebody on the parking team or a police officer or our spouse or yelling our kids, you know. Somebody else said, let him use you over here, but that's too far. Uh, but we, we're sinners that have been saved, but now we're saints. But we still struggle. But he's the God of all grace, not a little bit of grace. Not an inch of grace, not a, just a little bitty sand of grace, but a seashore of grace. Not a teaspoon of grace, but a fountain of grace. So you're gonna mess up. But don't walk around with your shoulders bent and your head down. Walk around with your shoulders up, your head up. Because God forgives you. God loves you. God wants to use you. He wants to help you. He wants to strengthen you because he knows as our lives are changed and we get freed from the sin and the bondage and the things that are less and the things that are temporary. So we get freed from that by his power, then he gets glory because of what he's done in our life. And his reputation increases and he starts using us. And that's for me. It's not so much about thinking what I'm struggling with. It's starting to think more about what I'm struggling for. Did you wake up to mo- this morning thinking about what you're struggling for? I believe sometimes, uh, I believe the more we struggle for something, the less we'll struggle with things because we don't have time to waste. We can't get distracted. We're on a mission and we got somewhere to go. So we need to remind ourselves what we're struggling for today. I'm struggling for my kids. I'm struggling for my wife, for my husband. I'm struggling for my friends at work that don't know Jesus. I'm struggling for my parents. I'm struggling in prayer for believing God's gonna change the people around me and he's gonna change me inside. That's what we gotta struggle for something. The devil, devil's happy. If you just spend all your time wallowing in your issues and your temptations and he keeps you distracted from the mission. That's Peter, right? Peter, the great, great apostle, the great church builder. I feel bad for him. He's done so much. We're even talking about him 2,000 years later, and he's been the rock that's helped build the church, right? But we all remember him for denying Jesus three times. But you look at that story. He had told Jesus, I'm your guy. You can count on me. I don't know about all these other jokers. I am your guy. That's willpower. That's pride. And what did uh, Jesus say to him? He said, and um, right, right after G- Peter said that, or no, right before it, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked or has demanded to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Simon Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. It's beautiful. He knew Peter was gonna let him down. He knew Peter was gonna deny him. He knew his closest friend and one of guys he had invested the most in was not gonna be able to withstand the pressure. Even before that in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, watch and pray that you won't fall into temptation or it was also right before said the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak he knew and he knows he knows your spirit's willing he knows my spirit's willing but he knows the flesh is weak and so we're praying that our faith wouldn't fail but Jesus is praying that your faith wouldn't fail that you would remember who he is, that you would remember where he is, and that you would remember and I would remember what he has done. And when we do mess up, just like Peter, he said, and after you turn, after you come back, after I send the angel to the tomb, then the girls are gonna show up, and after I tell, the angel tells those girls, go tell the disciples and make sure you tell Peter. 
You ever thought about that? He, he's one of the disciples. Why did he call him out? It's because he had just, the last moment he had had with Jesus, with, or with Peter, was Peter turning his back on Jesus, and that's what Peter's memory was. Go tell Peter, because I told him that I see his future. I told him that I was gonna see the denying, but I also told him I was gonna see him be the great builder of the church. So you go tell him I'm alive. You go tell him that sin's been dealt with, that hell's been dealt with, that death has been dealt with, because I gotta use Peter. I got plans for Peter. God, God sees your mistakes. He sees your weak spots. He sees the moments you're gonna turn your back on him but he sees your future. And just like he told Peter, he wants to tell you after you've turned, strengthen people, help people, strengthen your brothers, strengthen your sisters. Put your hand around somebody that's going through something. Maybe it's something you've been through. Don't uh, make fun of, don't belittle, don't condescend, but you just say, man, you got this. You can do this. I've been there and I made it through, so can you. I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. I might not know, not know what to say, but let me know if you need anything because you can count on me. It's time for you and me to continue to be on mission to strengthen our brothers and sisters. And we can do it when we have that victory mindset.